working. So with that, I will hand it over to Daniel to kick off the webinar. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So as you just heard, today's talk will dive into SpaceNet, learning about this effort to help build an open source analytics ecosystem with a focus on geospatial applications. Uh, during this talk, I will start with a general discussion of what SpaceNet is and what it does. And then we will look in much greater detail at the two most recent SpaceNet challenges, uh, mostly SpaceNet 6, which has now concluded, and a little bit about SpaceNet 7, which is underway as we speak. So what SpaceNet is, is it is a nonprofit LLC, which focuses on accelerating open source research, applied research in artificial intelligence uh, for geospatial applications. Uh, Cosmic Works, um, which is the organization that I'm a part of, is the managing partner, uh, but it's just one of the partners within SpaceNet. Uh, SpaceNet partners join on an annual basis. Some are new, some have been uh, here since the beginning. In addition to Cosmic Works, we have a number of partners from industry, including Maxar, Amazon Web Services, Capella Space, Topcoder, and Planet. We are also able to welcome in uh, some other kinds of members, including uh, Professional Society, which we, we all know, the IEEE GRSS, and also a government partner in the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. So the activities that SpaceNet undertakes uh, fall under four pillars, which all sort of relate to each other. It all begins with creating and releasing high quality data sets, data sets of labeled geospatial data that can be used for deep learning. And uh, over the years, this library of available data from SpaceNet has grown, and it now includes 110 different geographic locations uh, with overhead imagery covering some 66,000 square kilometers. Uh, at various resolutions and, and in different ways. Along with the imagery, of course, for deep learning, one requires labels. This needs to be labeled data. And within SpaceNet, we have a longstanding focus on foundational mapping. And so to that end, our labeling includes 10 million labels for building footprints, footprint just meaning the outline of the building in, in an overhead image and about 20,000 kilometers of road labels. So releasing a labeled data set is just the first step, the first pillar. The next one is that we organize data science challenges around this data. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have now completed six of these over the years. Seventh one is happening right now. And to incentivize participation and really draw in some of the best talent around, we've distributed about $300,000 in total prize money over the course of the previous competitions. Uh, that has uh, garnered interest, as has, of course, the, the intrinsic interest of, of getting a challenge like this and getting the kinds of data that, that uh, is used in these uh, competitions, and that has generated some 3,000, actually more than 3,000 submissions over the course of the challenges. And then one of the special things about SpaceNet is what happens next. We take those, the winning models from those competitions, and we don't keep them to ourselves. We open source those, just as the data is open sourced. Uh, so far, we've open sourced 18 building detection models and 10 road detection and routing models from participants in these challenges, the, the winning participants in these challenges, to be specific. 
For each challenge, we also develop a baseline model ourselves, which is like a starting point, a point of comparison. And for the last three challenges, we've uh, packaged those up nicely and open sourced them as well. Now, when the challenge comes to an end, the job is not done. What comes next and should not be neglected is a very careful process of evaluation. So part of that is benchmarking the models to, to see who's won. And for these challenges, we typically have a public test data set to determine who the top ones are, and then a private test data set to retest the candidates for the top slot on, the, uh, on a different data set that they've not seen before. But in addition to just evaluating the model performance, we also undertake very detailed analyses of the models. You know, really look at the code, understand why these are the winning models, what are their techniques. And um, that analysis is released. Uh, as I mentioned, the models are released, uh, pre-trained weights are, are released as well. So lots of, uh, lots of information flowing out to help um, really uh, accelerate the whole community working on these kinds of issues at the intersection of deep learning and geospatial. So it all starts with the data sets and to have a good data set in this area there are a couple of key things. First, you just need a data set of quality um, and what that means in particular is having high quality labels. Uh, the labels for our data sets are typically developed by SpaceNet members, hand annotating things. Um, in the case of SpaceNet 6, we actually were very fortunate that there was a, uh, a data set of building footprints already available uh, from the uh, government of the area of interest that, that met our needs. But, uh, but generally, we, we create those as well. Uh, one small detail that ends up being pretty important in terms of data availability is the license under which it is released. And some feedback we got early on was that a license that includes a non-commercial provision is actually very limiting because a lot of the work in this area is done by academics, sure, but a lot is done by companies as well. And many of them will hesitate to even touch something that has a non-commercial uh, clause in the license. Uh, for obvious reasons. So um, including permissive licensees on the data is, is important and, and something that we, we do now so that all parts of the community can make use of the data. For data accessibility, a key thing is for the data to be persistent, to have the competition run and then have the data not just disappear, but stay available um, and uh, stay accessible so that it can have a whole second life as something that's used in research and development efforts indefinitely. And we're fortunate to have our uh, data hosted on AWS um, with no charge to download, going back for all of the SpaceNet competitions, so that data remains available. And finally, a key characteristic for open data sets is also interoperability. And this means using uh, helpful and widely supportive uh, file formats, such as cloud-optimized geotiffs or indexing data with uh, the spatio-temporal asset catalog approach, which is something that, that SpaceNet has, uh, has been a fan of. Um, also, setting up your labels in a way that uses widely supported formats. And there's also an issue of interoperability with the evaluation metrics that you use to evaluate model performance because when those are commonly shared, it makes it easier for people to do uh, fair, fair comparisons. And actually in a number of cases, we found that existing metrics didn't really meet uh, what was needed for doing effective evaluations of geospatial deep learning for foundational mapping. So on a number of occasions, we've developed metrics of our own. And in each case, we've explained the motivation of the metric in blog posts, and released code implementing the metric and uh, you know, helped get it out so it's, uh, it's easy for lots of people to use. So that's what we're looking for in a good data set. And those are the considerations that have uh, 
guided our collect our uh, curation of, of our uh, data library over the years. And among the kinds of data we have are high resolution data of 11 cities, um, including for each of these electro optical data from Maxar's Worldview 2 or Worldview 3 satellites. These cities were chosen for a range of geographic diversity, uh, actually also seasonal diversity. We have a, a great data set of Moscow and winter. And two of these are a little special. The Atlanta data set includes images from a variety of different viewing angles that were all taken within minutes of each other as a calibration run for Worldview 2. And in the case of Rotterdam, we have electro-optical data, but we also have our first true multimodal data set because along with that is synthetic aperture radar data from Capella Space. So these are the cities where we have high resolution imagery. We also uh, just recently uh, were able to release a large amount of medium resolution imagery from Planet, um, covering, including many of the uh, cities from a set of about 100 uh, different locations all around the world, as you can see here. Here, um, this data was used for the SpaceNet 7 challenge, which is ongoing. The training data in blue, the public test data in orange, the private test data not shown. You can see a, a great geographic coverage there. But the imagery is only half the story. The other half is the labels. And uh, for the high resolution image, we have building footprints for some of the cities as polygons, not just pixel maps. We have the road topology for other cities. For some of the high res cities, we have both of those, which is good. And then for all of the medium resolution cities that we've released imagery of, we've released um, building footprints. Well, at least in the case of the training data, we've released the, uh, the building footprints. And uh, you can see in our choice of labels here, this strong interest in foundational mapping, you know, mapping out the, the fixed things there on the ground. Uh, we're interested in foundational mapping uh, um, for two reasons. One, it's a, a proxy for any number of geospatial challenges, but it's also very important in and of itself. You know, you can consider a case where perhaps there's been a natural disaster and you have to do some large logistical operation in an area that might not have been very well mapped before, or in the case of certain kinds of natural disasters, might have been well mapped, but the maps have become irrelevant if uh, the status of buildings and roads, for example, has been, has been changed by a, by a hurricane coming through or, or something like that. So with that foundational mapping focus in mind, we've run a series of SpaceNet challenges. In each case, a data set is released, the challenge is organized around it, we run through and involve all of those um, aspects of the SpaceNet model. And in selecting the projects, each, each new SpaceNet challenge is more ambitious than the ones that came before it, but each one also sort of ties back to the ones that came before it so that the knowledge can be brought forward and applied in new and more complex situations. We kind of get a wave of progress uh, coming through, advancing through these different tasks. So in the first SpaceNet challenge, we just looked, or we just asked uh, participants to find building footprints in one location, Rio de Janeiro. SpaceNet 2 brought geographic diversity with four different cities. SpaceNet 3 used those same cities, but varied the task, asking participants to find roads instead of building footprints. SpaceNet 4 and 5 revisited each of those two tasks, but brought them into a more real world context. In the case of SpaceNet 4, it was by looking for building footprints, but incorporating off nadir imagery, often following a natural disaster or any kind of time sensitive occurrence, the first images available could easily be off nadir, very off nadir even, just depending on where the satellites are when you need the imagery. In SpaceNet 5, we asked challenge participants to not only identify the roads, but to guess a plausible maximum reasonable travel speed for each road segment. 
because that's the missing ingredient you need to really do routing. What's the fastest way to get from A to B, which is commonly the most common thing that you really care about in a problem like this. SpaceNet 6, which we'll talk about uh, in greater detail in the following slides, use that multimodal data set of optical width synthetic aperture radar. And SpaceNet 7 was our first foray into time series using that medium resolution data from many different locations. And for each one, we didn't just have a single shot. We had a new image every month for two years, allowing for some, uh, some time series questions to be explored. So SpaceNet is just celebrated its four year anniversary. We're very pleased about that. It started back in 2016 with two founding partners, Cosmic Works and Digital Globe, which later became part of uh, Maxar. And Cosmic Works and Maxar are our member, our partners in SpaceNet to this day, along with uh, all the others that we talked about. But I think one way to look at the impact of this program over the past four years is just to quote the numbers. In our publicly available data on AWS, there have been 561 million hits, resulting in 773 terabytes of total downloads. We've open sourced 31 algorithms, the best of the best of 3,089 submissions across six challenges, and we've seen download activity from 82 different countries. So that's SpaceNet as a whole. Let's now take a much closer look at just one SpaceNet challenge, SpaceNet 6, which is the most recently completed one. This used our multimodal data set with electro-optical data and also synthetic aperture radar data. There are lots of advantages to using SAR, one of which is that no solar illumination is required and it can see through the clouds. So neither weather nor darkness uh, present any barrier to its use. Our data set, our multimodal data set, focused on Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Now this is a great choice because that's the largest port in Europe. So not only are there plenty of buildings, but there are also ships and piers and lots of activity there. And we have almost simultaneous collects of SAR and electro-optical, just a few days apart, actually. Our labels uh, come to some 48,000 building footprints. We approach this as another building footprint challenge um, in the new context of our multimodal data set. And there were two things we were really interested in here. The first was, um, how well do models perform at extracting building footprints from SAR imagery? Then the second question was, what can be done in terms of data augmentation? What interesting things may happen when you do have SAR not by, just by itself, but side by side with optical? The SpaceNet 6 challenge started in March of this year. The data was released a month before that. And the challenge ran for about a month and a half, which is uh, uh, pretty typical for SpaceNet challenges. And then it was uh, reported on at the CVPR Earth Vision workshop. For the data set in SpaceNet 6, the optical data was almost on Nader, just 17 degrees off. And uh, the SAR data was, of course, off Nader, as SAR data always is, because that's how it works, using its, its trick of uh, measuring the echo return time to figure out where things are. So it had a pretty typical off Nader angle for SAR of 35 degrees. The SAR data was collected from an aerial platform. This was an aerial test of hardware that Capella Space will be deploying um, on a future network of satellites but this was uh, testing it uh, here on the plane. And you can see that the SAR was collected in strips, which are uh, shown in the animation on the right-hand side there. 
So I was collected over three different days in August of last year. There were 204 strips in total, which meant that each area was revisited many times. That itself provides uh, some opportunities for this data set, which we didn't explore so much in the challenge itself, but remain possible. The SAR data here is X-band, it's quad polarization, and for the challenge, uh, we produced a product at 0.5 meter resolution, which is very high resolution for open source SAR. Alongside that, we had the optical collected a little bit later that same month uh, with the WorldView 2 satellite. So on the right-hand side of this slide, you see images of the SAR. It's colorized by just assigning different polarizations to the different colors. You also see the RGB from the optical and another image from uh, um, the electro-optical emphasizing the near-infrared band, which really lights up vegetation. The way that we structured the SpaceNet 6 challenge was that for training purposes, in the training data set, challenge participants were given SAR data and electro-optical data. But when it came time to test the models, when it came time to use them for inference, the participants only had access to the SAR data. The reason for this is that we wanted to structure this like a real world scenario where, sure, you might have historical archives of SAR and optical and multimodal and everything you might want, but then something happens. There's a natural disaster. It's time sensitive. You need an image. What if it's cloudy that day? You only get the SAR. And that's what we wanted to simulate. Alongside the data, we, of course, needed labels. In this case, we got kind of a lucky break in that the government of the Netherlands uh, maintains and open sources very accurate building footprint labels, which we were able to adapt to our purposes. Um, one thing to keep in mind with this is that the original data set had a label for every address. And if you have something like row houses, which are quite common, at least in this part of uh, Rotterdam, uh, many addresses might effectively be a single building. So to take that into account, we merged adjacent polygons in the original data set to get something that was less like legal addresses and, and more like buildings as seen from above. Even this data set was not perfect and some manual quality control was uh, required to fix some issues, in particular to identify some areas where labels were missing to just make sure to exclude that from our testing and training data. As mentioned, uh, for each challenge, we release a baseline. The idea here is to help out competitor challenge participants by giving them an example of a complete solution to the challenge, which they may ignore entirely, of course, or may choose to use as a starting point in terms of ideas or code as they go off to develop their own solutions. So this slide shows an example of the SpaceNet 6 baseline at work. Here you see optical and SAR data for one location. If this were a training location, both would be available, but for testing, only the SAR is available. So that third image shows the building footprints extracted just from the SAR. Comparing them to the ground truth, you can see an overall correspondence, but also definite room for improvement. And as we'll see, improving on this is exactly what the challenge participants think. A note about how the baseline model works, at its heart is a neural network with a UNet architecture using a VGG11 encoder. One of the interesting things about working with SAR is that there are some strange geometric effects. And you can see that in this middle image uh, here. Here there's land at the top of the image, water at the bottom, and there are three skyscrapers right along the coast. But there's this strange distortion where the skyscrapers seem to jut out into the water. Uh, this happens because the radar echo from the top of the building returns to the instrument before the radar echo from the bottom of the building. And this uh, effect is called layover. So in the model, we just needed to be careful to rotate the images in some cases so that this effect was at least consistent among uh, the different images. In the baseline model, to take advantage of the optical data, we used a transfer learning approach where the model was first trained on the opt optical 
and then train on the SAR. Now, for this challenge, or, or really for almost anything with deep learning, you need a metric to evaluate how well the model is doing. What do you count as a success? And for this, we used what we call the SpaceNet metric, which is a very elegant solution to this problem. For every pair of ground truth building footprint and predicted building footprint, uh, if their intersection over union exceeds one half, it's considered a match, and we count the F1 score for the match. Uh, for, or for those matches, I mean. The baseline performance got an F1 score this way of 0.21, which is larger than what you can get with the baseline model if you ignore directionality or don't use the optical data at all. Um, but the challenge participants were able to do much better than that. So on the, the number on the previous slide was for the public test data. On the private test data, the baseline got a score of 24, an F1 score of 0.24. Uh, but the top winner in the actual competition did 74% better than that. Here's an image from the first place winner. You can see the ground truth building footprints in orange overlaid on the SAR and the predicted footprints from the winner in, um, in green. And there's a small offset, not surprising because uh, SAR imagery is off Nader imagery and, and that often happens, but overall this is really good. So how did they do it? That brings us to that evaluation step, really studying the, the models. A um, Couple things. Uh, one of the things that a lot of the winners did was they used an efficient net neural network architecture. This is a new architecture that um, often performs very competitively with architectures that are much heavier and, and hence much slower than it is. The other thing that uh, all of our top five winners did is they used model weights that were pre-trained on ImageNet. Now ImageNet images are a lot less relevant to overhead SAR than overhead optical, but ImageNet is also a much larger data set. And uh, that really paid out in terms of pre-training. In fact, some of the top place ones didn't use the optical overhead imagery at all. Um, there are a lot of interesting results that came out of studying these models. And, uh, and here I'm really presenting uh, the work of my, my colleague, Jake Schirmeyer, who was the challenge manager for SpaceNet 6. He uh, led a lot of this as it uh, all came in, into being and, and did a lot of this analysis. I don't have time to talk about all of the things that, that he really studied, but I'll just mention a, a couple here and direct you to uh, Cosmic Works uh, a blog, which I'll have a link for shortly, um, if you would like to learn more. Or you can ask me in the questions, of course, too. Uh, one of the things that Jake looked at was how does model performance depend on the size of the buildings? So specifically, how does recall vary with the size of the building footprints? And what he found, and, and maybe this isn't surprising, but it's easier to find the larger buildings. And in particular, what, what is kind of interesting is basically below about 40 square meters, even with this high resolution SAR imagery, it's it gets uh, just about impossible to find the buildings with SAR alone. And that may have something to do with the fact that in optical data, you get a clue for even very small structures just from using the colors. Whereas with SAR, you know, there's still information in the different polarizations, but it seems to just not be as effective at a task like this when you're talking about very small buildings, very small footprints. There's a similar pattern when you look at building heights. Um, in this case, medium height buildings do the best. At the very smallest buildings, um, performance as measured by recall gets very small. Um, and that has to do with things like the fact that uh, very short buildings, much easier for them to be occluded by trees or other buildings, things like that. But Another effect that's a little 
less subtle, but still interesting, is that as you start getting into very tall buildings, well, the data gets a bit noisy because there aren't too many very tall buildings in the data set, but even still, you can see that performance begins to slightly get worse as you get to really tall buildings. And that may be related to these issues of SAR geometry, in particular, the issue of layover. So here you see uh, that same SAR image we saw before with uh, the skyscrapers in it, their ground truth building footprints here in orange. This was an area that the winning model really struggled in. And these geometric effects may have something to do with that. You know, compare this to the slide we saw a few slides back um, with medium height buildings where the model did extremely well. I think since time is limited, I'm gonna jump past some of these other analysis things and uh, just mention a few more things here uh, about SpaceNet 6. The first is that we ended up writing a lot of image processing code in the course of preparing the, the SAR images and getting them into exactly the format we wanted for the challenge. We realized that that was something we'd like to be able to reuse. And so we built it out into uh, what we're calling the Solaris Multimodal Preprocessing Library. And this, like um, quite a bit of what we do, it has been open sourced. It's uh, available on GitHub as part of Solaris, which is an end-to-end -end geospatial deep learning Python package developed by Cosmic Works. In the case of the preprocessing library, you can do image processing tasks by first picturing the flowchart of what you want to do, then creating a Python object for each task in the flowchart, and all the common ones are already there among the, the 60 plus classes that have been written already. And then with one line of code that actually looks like a, a math equation, it's a very con concise notation, you uh, tell the computer how all those tasks are wired together and you have your pre-processing pipeline. So here's an example of, uh, of using it for a pan sharpening algorithm, because this was written originally with SAR in mind, but can do a lot of other things. We've also done a re-release of the SpaceNet 6 data. And in the re-release, the highlight of that is the original complex valued SAR strips uh, from Capella Space, the original single look con uh, complex with all of the phase information still intact. So we processed these into magnitudes in the way that we wanted for SpaceNet 6, but since there are a lot of judgment calls about what's the best way to process this, a lot of things that people might want to try, we wanted to ma maximize the research and development potential of this unique data set by giving everybody access to everything. So one can really uh, get experimental, try out lots of stuff with this uh, SAR. I'll say just a little bit about SpaceNet 7 which is happening right now. Um, and there's still time to participate if you're interested. Uh, SpaceNet 7 uses, as mentioned before, a data set that is a time series. So for each of our 100 locations, we have uh, one picture every month for two years, give or take. You can see an example there. These uh, areas were not randomly selected. They were picked uh, by Planet to try to oversample areas with construction. So there are things that are changing in terms of um, the human infrastructure. There are also seasonal changes, changes in, in crops and all sorts of things going on. Um, the other thing about this data set is that we have building footprints and they're assigned ID numbers that are consistent from month to month. So we can track buildings from month to month uh, as time goes by and as new buildings are constructed. So the challenge for participants in SpaceNet 7 is not just to identify the buildings in these individual images for each AOI, but to assign the buildings a set of tracking numbers that have that same consistency about them so that the same building as it reappears in image after image is given the same tracking number. We needed a way to evaluate performance on a task like that. 
And this was just one of those things where there really wasn't an adequate uh, evaluation metric out there in the literature. So we invented our own. Um, the, uh, the typical metrics for tracking objects in film, which is kind of the closest uh, common task to something like this, um, did not do well in cases where many of the objects were static. You know, most of these buildings are here the whole time and they're not going anywhere but cases where there is also some change and that change is really important. So our solution to this problem was to design a metric that we call SCOT, the SpaceNet Change in Object Tracking Metric. And that has two terms, a footprint tracking term that uh, um, measures the uh, performance on buildings in general and a change detection term that looks specifically at uh, change, which in, in this case is, uh, is ent almost entirely in the form of new construction. And uh, those two terms balance each other out, giving us uh, a very good overall metric for measuring performance. Um, and this is the uh, metric that we're using in SpaceNet 7. So I hope that in giving you this kind of detailed look into the analysis of SpaceNet 6 and the plans for SpaceNet 7. Hopefully you've, you've seen some interesting things about SAR or, or multimodal data sets. Um, but also the hope is that this has maybe illustrated something of the approach of SpaceNet involving all four of those pillars um, to really build out an interesting program of challenges and ones which have a real lasting impact in furthering work in this community at the intersection of deep learning and geospatial. If you'd like to learn more, there are lots of places you can go. Uh, Cosmic has a blog uh, that talks about a lot of the work that is done uh, in SpaceNet. Um, there is also a podcast top called Training Data, which talks about these things a lot. Uh, SpaceNet has a Twitter account, as does uh, many of the part, as do many of the partners. You can see the, the links there. And a lot of the code that I've mentioned, um, the baselines, the winning algorithms, those are available on uh, either SpaceNet's repo or Cosmic's repo. SpaceNet has a website as well. And uh, again, the SpaceNet 7 challenge is ongoing. Uh, there is still time to join. There is even still time to get free AWS credits so you can participate in, these, in the challenge, even if you don't have a GPU of your own at all. You want to really lower the barrier to entry. And uh, so I encourage you all to check that out. And for now, I'll, uh, I'll take uh, questions or comments. All right, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate this. It's been uh, really interesting. We're starting to get to questions from a couple of different um, angles here from a couple of different directions. Uh, the first question is, what is the spatial resolution in um, the SpaceNet 7 multispectral images? So the, oh, good question. The resolution works out to uh, about four meters uh, per pixel. And then our, our images are a thousand uh, pixels on the side. Say that one more time, how many pixels on the side? So it's, uh, it's about uh, four meters uh, GSD. Mm -hmm. And so given the size of the images, that works out to those areas of interest being squares that are uh, four kilometers on the side. Okay, cool. Um, the next question is, can these models be used for commercial purposes? Um, yes, absolutely. Our, uh, our philosophy of avoiding the non-commercial only restraint applies to the code as well. Um, I know that some, some of our code is released under the Apache license. I'm not sure if all of it is, but if it's not, it's, it's released under kind of equivalent things. Uh, so yes, it is, it is all open for commercial use as well as any other kind of use. Just got a question from chat that's right along the lines of a question that I had 
I'd written in my notes um, uh, it, it kind of revolves around um, spatial coverage. So the specific question is any, pl any plan to apply previous base net results to a wider spatial coverage? Um, you know, I, I have similar, similar questions here, like have you run challenges where the location of inference is hidden? Um, you know, where you train a model in one location and how would you determine the extent of the model's applicability spatially? Absolutely, that's, that's a great set of questions there. Um, so we are definitely interested in, um, in, ex in uh, expanding the wider areas. Uh, in, by the way, one of the things that uh, my, my colleague Adam Van Etten has worked on is taking, um, well, he worked on it in the case of road networks in particular, taking the network for a single tile, but then very cleanly combining the results from different tiles. So you can generate the roadmap for an entire city uh, if, you, if you have the imagery. Uh, the, the visuals from that are, are spectacular. But the, but the question was really going after, what if you're talking about entirely different areas? Do the models carry over? And that is um, a question that we are interested in. That's something that we looked at in terms of SpaceNet, uh, let me get the number right, SpaceNet 5. So SpaceNet 5, which was the road network and travel time problem, we had the challenge participants get six different cities to train on. And then the testing was done on a set of cities um, that was not the same as the training cities. So in particular, the, we gave the greatest weight in terms of evaluating model performance to deciding who won and who got the prize money. We gave the greatest weight to performance on a city, the identity of which was kept secret for the whole duration of the competition. So we got, we got to have a little secret that the participants didn't know about. Um, it was Dar es Salaam, T Tanzania. It's not, uh, not a secret anymore. But, uh, but that was a case where we were wondering, you know, if you make a really wonderful model for, for one city, does it carry over? And we wanted to, to put that to the test. That, that's a topic that we're also interested in, in looking at more in the future, because it is an interesting question. How would, you, how would you measure variability on that? So I, I would imagine that the choice of the hidden city might actually determine the outcome more than the, the, the analytic or maybe the suitability of the training data for a model in the, train, uh, in the target city or something to that effect. Have, have you, like, yeah, what are the no, thoughts there as far as variability? It, could. it certainly could. And that is, you know, the drawback of just having one city um, in, in that role. We did try to pick a city that the initial tests indicated might not necessarily be the most, um, um, uh, unusual in, in terms of its, in terms of its general traits or, or, or difficult because of specifically regional specific things. Um, but that is something that we have thought about revisiting in a more, in a more systematic way of looking at, you know, what things are similar, what things are different, why, why is that happening? And that probably leads into a, a kind of a class of questions that we're getting here. Um, this asking, what will future space nets be about? Do you have any thoughts on where you're going? And specifically, one question here is asking if you have thought about um, running a collapse building um, challenge. That there's so many different areas that uh, would really benefit from something like this. I uh, absolutely a sort of a kind of disaster response thing where you do have actual you're evaluating the extent of damage that that's interesting. We were you know we've been wanting for for such a long time to get synthetic aperture radar data and to get time series data. So it was really uh, exciting for us that the kind of opportunities arose where we were able to do that for for SpaceNet six and seven. There are many things in those domains. Uh, lots, lots of, lots of ideas out there. 
So there's a question here. I'm just going to read it verbatim. Um, for the tracking metric on SpaceNet 7, the most important thing is consistency. Is accuracy taken into account? Um, if my model assigns the wrong ID consistently over time to some building, is it penalized? Ah, that is a good question. Um, so it depends on what way it is wrong. So first of all, if their ID number is different from the ground truth files ID number, then there's no penalty for that because how can you possibly know from just looking at the picture what numbers were assigned to what buildings in the ground truth uh, file? You know, there's no way of knowing that. But, but it gets a little more tricky when the question is, what happens if you make a, uh, a mistake? So, in this example, so here in this case, you've got four buildings in a row. Uh, you've got different labels. The buildings are labeled one, two, three, and four. The different proposal footprints all have uh, various ID numbers. So in this situation here, in, in building two, I'm initially tracking it with a number. And as long as I'm consistent, I'm fine. But then over here, in the month of April, I make a mistake. Instead of footprint 12 getting mapped to building two, I assign footprint 12 to building number one. So in that case, I consider this to be an incorrect assignment and that's penalized um, because this footprint was previously assigned to a different, this proposal was previously assigned to a different building. And I consider this a mistake and it gets penalized because this building previously had a different proposal assigned to it. So those are penalized. But then going forward, you can see in May, everything's fine again. Green is the happy no penalty color um, because, you know, sure, a one time mistake was made there. But from here on out, things are done consistently. So it wouldn't be fair to just keep penalizing a set of proposals month after month for a one-time error. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, I don't see a follow-up question coming in on that. Sorry, there's, there's a bunch of questions coming in all at once, so I'm, I'm trying to parse as quickly as I can here. Um, one additional question, uh, Said, is there any other source other than AWS from where you can get the uh, SpaceNet Challenge imagery and labels? Uh, for the imagery and labels, I believe right now AWS is the place there. I believe for now, it, I, I, there might, I'm not entirely sure, but I know okay. AWS has I, everything and I know that it is free to download. Okay, I'm assuming that's due to maybe access difficulties internationally. Um, I'm, yeah, okay. Let's see, moving on. Um, yeah, I think that covers most of what's coming in. Are there any other follow-up questions um, from, the, from the audience? If not, I, I have a couple of questions here that I, I'd like to throw out real quick and then we'll, we'll close it down, um, maybe five till. Uh, with the multi-temporal data sets in SpaceNet 7, do you have any sort of uh, missing data validation in the, in, in the experimental setup? You do the metrics account for when the, the validation data sets are noise like are noisy, like maybe you have a cloudy image or two or three in a row, or is it more um, like do you do you have any sort of mechanism to explicitly uh, encourage models that are resilient to gap filling or anything like that? Ah, that is a good question because yes, that is absolutely a problem. Um, sometimes there are clouds, and sometimes there is haze. And so the way that that is dealt with is that the challenge participants, in addition to the building footprint labels, they get a set of polygons that are the, the bad areas, the places where there are clouds, the places where there are haze, the places that they're basically instructed 
you know, just just ignore the stuff that's happening here. There's clouds, we know it. Don't don't worry about doing predictions there. And so for the that actually affects the evaluation metric because the metric had to be able to um, account for that. So in this example, in April, we've got two of the buildings disappearing. Presumably there was a cloud right here in April. And so we I just see. needed to, to build that into the metric. It, it wasn't very hard, but you know, we don't want, we don't want people to come back the next month and have every building label be considered wrong because it wasn't there the month before or something when, uh, yeah, it's just clouds. That, that makes sense. Um, one last question I wanted to ask is the, one of the themes I saw at IGARS this year was the kind of broad inclusion of social media uh, labels or information into um, geospatial models. Um, do you see a role for third party data in, in uh, future challenges? Um, if so, what do you think the, what, what do you, what do you think that uh, that external, like non-geospatial data, might look like? Um, we haven't really, we haven't worked uh, with with that kind of data in SpaceNet. That would uh, that would certainly be a, a extreme form of a multimodal data set <laughs> that would uh, bring some unique challenges. You, you might have to change the name from not SpaceNet to. I don't know, some other net. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. Well, it's, it's a um, popular naming paradigm. We're running out of available nets. Yeah, exactly. Um, and is there, do you encourage, do the challenges encourage or discourage bringing in external data? Um, like do they, are you limited to the, the, the data that is provided or if you have some sort of an external metric or external data source, are you encouraged to bring that in as long as the output runs against the validation? Uh, we do uh, allow bringing in external data and the, the rules vary a little bit, but where we have seen this a lot is people bringing in um, pre-trained weights from other places. So in that case, they're not necessarily like bringing along their own images, they're bringing along the, the processed product um, either from them or, or probably more likely from, from other people, from, you know, running on the image net or, or things like that. Um, in that case, we do require challenge participants to get approval for their specific set of weights that they're using because we need to make sure it's under a sufficiently permissible license for derived products from it to be releasable in the open way and the non-commercial way that we want to be able to release things. But in general, if participants have a, a set of weights or something, they just ask, hey, hey can I use this? And if it's, if it's good, then, uh, then absolutely. Awesome. Well, I think we're, we're running up against time. So for the questions that have been coming in that I didn't get to, I apologize. Um, you know, these might be a good opportunity to um, engage with uh, Daniel or SpaceNet on um, social media um, and uh, GRSS also has an account. We're happy to, you know, bring conversations into, into that space as we're, as we're all moving a little more virtually these days. Um, so with that, I want to say, uh, I express my gratitude again, Daniel. I appreciate you taking the time to come here and present for all of us. Um, we look forward to the next time and possibly, uh, um, Igar is in Brussels next year. You never know. It looks like we, we're, uh, we're, we're in the middle of planning for, for what that might look like. Um, so one last reminder, please um, do follow us, follow GRSS and Cosmic Works and SpaceNet on social media. Um, keep, in, uh, keep in touch with the, the, the events that are going on. Um, GRSS will have events running through the rest of the fall. And uh, please see the chat box for information um, on, those, uh, on those upcoming events. So with that, we'll go ahead and close down. Um, once again, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate the time. And to everyone that attended, I appreciate you also taking the time and I uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.